Hi there and welcome to the This Is Ibrox podcast live on Wednesday uh, and I can I think I speak for everybody here when I can say let's get this international break over and done with already. I don't even know if there's been a game played in the international calendar but I'm sick of it already. Uh, as always I'm joined by two fantastic guests. Uh, Kieran actually feels like it's been a few Wednesdays since you and I have been on. How are you my friend? I'm good, it does, it certainly does. Have you missed me? Yeah, I, I've been te- have you not noticed by all the texts you've been getting on the Wednesdays from me and all the voice messages and stuff? Mate, you know what they say, absence makes a heart grow fonder. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, and I can't wait to get back to Ibrox. And Ian, oh, how's good. yourself? All good, yes, favourite night of the week because of this podcast, so yes, ready to go. There you go, and I know you've had an early one after that Man United announcement this morning. You've been up buzzing uh, and uh, texting everybody about how excited you are going to that game. Eh? <laughs> but listen, as always, there's loads to talk about, and we will we will try and talk about as much Rangers as possible. Uh, we'll get the guys' thoughts on the Rangers players away in international duty. I'm slightly biased in that. Apart from the big tournaments, I don't really give a hoot about international football. We'll get the guys' thoughts on that. Um, there's been some interesting chat that Wolves would be opening to selling Fabio Silva. Uh, get the guys' uh, thoughts on that. What do you think about that as well? Obviously, we just mentioned there that there's a glamour friendly in Edinburgh of all places against Man United. The rearranged game with Dundee, the, the, the SPFL statement we'll get. We'll get into that as well. Maybe saw a comment that Georgie Hadji, I totally forgot that Yaris was even at Rangers. <laughs> so we'll maybe get to that as well. And the final question, uh, I want to leave, and everybody leave your ticket, uh, because I just read the word tickets there, uh, leave your comments uh, there about who you think will step up for Rangers until the end of the season for this title running. Uh, first of all, I'll talk about the international break. As I've already said, I don't enjoy international football. It's I just see it's pointless. I think Rangers have released that they have eight players away in international duty this week. Kieran, I'll come to you first on this. It's a really, really simple question. And I'll caveat this by starting off saying, I'm not saying Rangers don't send your players away in international duty, but as being called up, you know, all it's cracked out to be. Um, what's, what's your thoughts up uh, on Rangers players going in international duty? I think you've got to look at it from the player's point of view. Like That has got to be the biggest honour of basically being a football player and getting called up for your country and playing. Like, I, I can see it. I know we're big Rangers fans and a lot of times we see things through blue-tinted specs, but if you were a player, like there could be no bigger honour than getting called up for your, for your country, especially with a major tournament round the corner. Um, but Looking at it from the other side, I think there's benefits to guys not being called up and we've benefited from it a lot and I think we will benefit from it. The likes of James Tavenier, Connor Goldson being the quickest player at 300 games for Rangers, John Lundstrom, these guys aren't getting called up, they're not picking up injuries and a wee bonus maybe that Butland didn't get called up, the fact that he's going to be fit, he's going to be healthy and fresh for when we come back for the biggest point in our season and these guys have got to get, be ready to go. So, like I say, there is a good side to it um, in terms of the, the sort of high-flying English players that we've got at the moment. So, it's good to see these guys rested. But, no, nah, I, I really can't grudge the guys that are away in international duty, especially the ones that are competing in uh, teams that are going to be in the Euros come the summer. So, no, nah, good on them. But I get, I get the sentiment that it's... It's boring as hell during these weeks, and especially when it's friendlies. It's not even competitive. Like I, I'm, I'm not one of these folk that turn a blind eye to the the national team. I, I'm a Scotland fan too. So the fact that it's friendlies, even when friendlies, keep an interest. Really, is it? So we're quite. But on the on the whole, we're quite happy. It's an international break. Our players needed a rest, like a team I'd never ever seen when I think back to the 08 season when we went to the, the UEFA Cup final and then uh, under Gio when we went to Europa League final, the players were tired, they were legging, we lost the league in both seasons there, um, especially the 08 one, we were fully in the driver's seat of that one, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm quite happy to see this international break in, in a sense without any European football afterwards. Yeah, I, 
I, I can see where you're coming from. I, I, I see both sides, you know, of it in terms of it's it's good to get these guys in the shop window, so to speak. You know, players are at peak. Oh God, I hate the word buzzwords you mentioned already, but they're, they're peak value. You know, when they're on display, not even playing for their club in these international tournaments. But you know, Ian, for me, I, I just look at it as in terms of whenever we. Oh, it tends to be whenever we send players away on international duty. I couldn't tell you the last time we had a full roster of players coming back that, that weren't injured. The big one for me this season was Abdul Asima going away um, with Senegal over at the African Cup of Nations. Didn't even play for them and is is still out injured. Um, Ryan Jack seems to be perpetually injured every time he goes away with Scotland. What What's your thoughts on it? Is it, is it all it's cracked up to be? I think I'm going to go more on your side with this. See, I, I wish we were a bit more cynical with it. And I think the best two examples of who do it best are Man City and Liverpool. I think over the years, you've noticed that there's always a wee star player or two who just gets a little niggle or a wee strain or just something on the eve of a friendly game, of international friendly. They just miss the tournament or miss, miss the game, sorry. Uh, De Bruyne, for example, is out for Belgium's game. Pretty certain he'll be back in the Man City squad for their next league game. I think the problem we have, but is obviously we've got like seven or eight guys away. All of them aren't exactly regulars for that national team. Like you look at Sutter, he's going to want to go and put on a good show so that he's starting at the Euros. Red Vans, I don't think he was in the squad initially and get drafted in. So again, same idea. He's going to need to go and try and impress. Dessers isn't exactly first choice for Nigeria. I don't think he went to AFCON. He was in the discussion, but never went kind of thing. So all these guys do have something to play for. I guess McCausland, I saw one of the comments and I agree with it. McCausland wasn't fit enough to go. So why did he even try and go kind of thing? I think he went and got sent away and they're now going to see if he's fit for the game in, in Glasgow. But that one's just a bit daft for me. And maybe Fabio Silva was going away with under 21s. Could we have withdrew that in some way, I'd have hoped. But yeah, I, I get Kieran's point as spot on. You want these guys to be playing at national football. It's what they'll be wanting to do. How great it must it be to represent your country kind of thing. But if I could see Suter sitting on his arse for two weeks, I would much rather see that than sitting possibly getting injured. Like, same idea with the rest of the guys. Like I, I just think they could have all done with a good rest here, and now we're not going to get that. Yeah, I think it's interesting what you've said there. I think we'll need to get the TII lawyers, uh, give them a wee phone call, make sure we've not uh, upset anybody at Liverpool or Man City there. <laughs> but yeah, I, t I totally get what you mean. It is. It's, these bigger clubs are, are are the very big clubs in the Premier League, I should say, are. They are. They are. They're smart with it. And it's OK. I know De Bruyne was out for a large part of the season, but surely your, your key assets, you, you've got to be protecting them but then again it's really difficult to say to an international a player who has been called up for the country you know maybe maybe set this one out um because uh, you know we're paying your wages here but yeah i can see i can see both sides to the story um and you go Keaton? yeah i was gonna say think about the morelos the morelos one back when he came off against dundee and then we sent him away with columbia comes back and he's out for the season if that doesn't happen, we win a Europa League. I don't care what anybody says. We win that with a fit Morelos up front. Yeah. 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 That's that that's the most frustrating one for me. And Ian's bang on. Like I think in that occasion we should have been a lot cuter about it. Just look, he's come off against Dundee, carrying a thigh injury. We're going to keep him here and we have the injury. And that wins us a Europa League and potentially the league. Yeah, oh man, I, I was I was trying to start this podcast off on a, on a sort of positive note there, but uh, Andy Anderson of this parish, uh, that's what caught me off guard there. He says, ban international football, it's a load of push. <laughs> and I, I find it hard to disagree with him there. But look, there's one wee question I just want to, um, I'll come to you Ian for this one. It's just because it's about football as a whole, um, the Mohamed Diomande situation <laughs> obviously has eligibility to play for Ghana through, I think he was there for five years in the Aspire Academy. Um, they've cheekily quite named them in their, in their squad for their upcoming friendlies, but then the Ivory Coast under 23 uh, team have also named them in their squad for the upcoming friendlies. What do you think about that from a football point of view? Is that just Ghana trying to pull a fly one? Can, can you respect that? But <laughs> I think the best thing to do for Diamandi here is to reject both and just stay at home for a bit. Have a good think about <laughs> what he wants to do long term there. Um, 
I, I don't know. It's, it's a weird one. Um, like I said, I don't think any of us had any idea he was linked to Ghana or, or had that like eligibility. We obviously saw in the training videos, all the Ivory Coast flags and stuff like that. So if he wants to go and play right now, Ghana's probably a better shout. Um, I'm not too clued up on their midfield, but I can't think of anyone that stands out. I know they've got Kudos, the West Ham boy, who's obviously brilliant, but I don't think he'd be fighting him for a spot. Whereas Ivory Coast team just won. AFCON probably a bit harder to get into longer term, but yeah, it's, it's a bit of a strange one because um, I don't think it's not been confirmed if he's joined up with either of those just yet. I don't know if he's going to no. try and split himself in two to do that, but yeah, he's he's an only one of the ones that I think really does need a rest in all of this. I mean, you look at guys like Lundstrom, Tav, Goldson, as, as Kieran said, they're not going anywhere, so they're going to get that proper rest. He's like, he's next in line for me that he's one of I'm not going to come on to what like we're talking about later in terms of who's the most important for the run in here, but he's yeah. going to be pretty key. Um, and if he, you know, touch with if he does get a kind of injury or a little knock playing for either of these nations, then we're suddenly relying on a few guys coming in for the cold. So I, I don't know. I hope he maybe goes and just sees what Ghana's like, gets too used to the teammates and stuff, maybe sits a couple of games on the bench. But let's just pray that he doesn't get any injuries for this. Yeah, no, the, the way Diomandi plays at times, it almost is like there's two of them on the pitch, so so you never know, there might be one of them in the Ghana squad and the Ivory Coast squad as well, but a wee couple of comments here, uh, RFC72 says, this is the only international break I'm glad for, get some players back, some up to speed, and then on we go, and Paul McGarrigal here says, club should always have the say in whether players go or not, which is interesting. Um, Kieran, the next point I'll come on to here, uh, Fabio Silva Mentioned it a wee bit at the start there, and he's the guy who I definitely think we'll talk about later on in terms of who will step up for Rangers towards the end of the season. Um, talking Wolves, uh, they put out this tweet. Uh, Wolves are reportedly planning to sell Fabio Silva this summer. It is said that Wolves will demand at least £15 million for the Portuguese striker who is currently on loan at Rangers. Ignoring the fee for the minute, and I know that's a pretty mental thing to say, <laughs> given that... <laughs> It's, it's quite a large part of the football transfer is how much the person costs. But see a guy you would like to see kept on at Rangers next year? 100%, but just not in that capacity. Um, would I spend 15 million on him? I know you said ignore it. No, <laughs> if I wasn't to spend 15 million on him, would I give him 80,000 a week in wages that's reported? Probably not either. Um, but that doesn't take away the fact that I think he's going to have a real strong finish to the season for us. I thought I was against Benfica. I thought it was very quiet. They'd done a good job on him. Previous game, um, the, the away leg over in Lisbon, I thought it was tremendous. I thought he had an excellent game. Um, and then after that, again, I thought it was brilliant. So it, it looks like he's coming on to a game being on that left-hand side. It looks more of a comfortable position for him where he likes to sort of go at players and pull the ball in and influence the game a wee bit more before he gets into that number nine position. But if you were to say to me, right, the budget, you can buy one of Abdallah Sima and Fabio Silva, I'd bite the hand off Abdallah Sima for you. Yeah, I think that's a fair comment. Uh, there's a few wee comments coming on here. Callum C says it's too much. Malky McLaren says we will not be paying that kind of money. And KW says half that. You know, it's interesting. Rangers did some clever deals, shall we say, over the January transfer window there, Ian. Um, I, I, there's no chance in hell that we'll put anything like £15 million pounds towards a, a transfer. But if a deal was structured, you know, where it was paid in instalments type thing, it, you know, he's a young player, somebody obviously Niels Coppins worked with in the past. Um, could you see this, you know, happening? Is it just pie in the sky stuff? Um, I was tweeting about this this morning that I think it does have potential. Um, I'm going to get proper like football manager in my head here, but... <laughs> if we can get some kind of deal where it's like a season-long loan, which we're paying a fee for, say two, three million pounds, right? Not too much, but player of quality is going to cost a fair bit. And then you've got a kind of optional add-on at the end of that, maybe a seven and eight million. And then you talked about it, add-ons. And if he does have a good season or two for us, he could easily double in that value, especially if that's like Champions League. If if he gets like recognised, maybe an international call up kind of thing, suddenly he's worth twenty million easily. And if we've got a sell on that. Same idea as Celtic had with Jota for um, with Benfica. That sort of 
same numbers we're talking, then I can see Wolves doing that. I mean, the thing for us is, as you say, we're not paying 15 million. That's not happening. We're not paying double figures million for anybody. No. His wages are maybe 80 grand a week as well. So not quite sure how we're doing it right now, to be honest. I don't know what kind of strange dealings have pulled with them over January there. But the thing is, I don't see any club paying 15 million for silver. I don't see any club paying 80,000 pounds a week for silver. So it's all well and good Wolves putting out that kind of feelers like, oh, we want 15 million. Any club's going to do that, but who yeah. realistically is going to pay that? I know he's done quite well at PSV and they're going to have some money kicking about, so they might be willing to pay towards that. But as far as you see from me, it looks like he's enjoying it up here. All the comments, the wee little press releases he's given seems to be that he's loving it. If he does end this season with a treble and he sort of fires his way or does his bit there to get us there, I can see us doing all that we can to try and keep him for at least another year. And if he does stay for another year, develops, then Wolves might see that as, as more of a, a smart move from them business-wise to not lose, what was it, 35 million they paid for him kind of thing. So they're going to make a massive loss either way. But I just don't see anyone paying the kind of money that they're talking about initially. So that might bode well for us. See, the thing yeah. is, if you're silver, right, right this is no disrespect if we've got any Wolves fans listening or anything <laughs> like that, right? But... <laughs> He must be absolutely loving it here, right? The fans here are unbelievable. That's not to say the Wolves fans are poor, uh, poor but we're very recognised for having a very lovable fan base that kind of, we, we just, I don't know, when players come here, they just tend to love it. And Silva's no different in England, but this is the thing. In England, he's probably received a big, big payday, a young age going to Wolves with a massive transfer fee, Big wages, no doubt a massive signing on bonus for what mid table mediocrity and your goal each season is to beat relegation. Then you come to Rangers, you're competing for a treble, you're in the last 16 of the Europa League, playing against a team that dumped you when you were younger, basically, um, <laughs> and turning in a man of the match performance. So it's no wonder he's loving it here. And I think it bodes well for Rangers in that sense as well um, that a guy of his stature and his transfer fee is saying how much he loves it and how, how good a club we are and how good a fan base. So, like he says, get him back in for another year next year in loan. I think that would be our best bet. Yeah, I think I think that's a fair comment. It was just, Ian was giving me severe flashbacks there by our PTSD by mentioning that PSV might come in and take another bloody loan player that's, <laughs> <laughs> that we've got and uh, might buy them from underneath us. Um, but yeah, a few of the comments, or quite a lot of the comments are, are, are agreeing with you both there. Donald here says, I'm not sure Silva has done enough for that cash, which I think's, I think's fair. Uh, Callum C says, Brighton will want around the same for Sima too. We need to look elsewhere. Uh, RSC72 says straight swap for right for Fabio Silva. I was actually thinking Sam Lammers could go there, seeing as he's apparently smashing it with Utrecht over in Holland. Um, so, yeah, we'll see what's going on there. Um, right, the next point we'll come on to. Uh, obviously, we knew that the game at the weekend was postponed due to a water log pitch. The SPFL released a statement on the 18th of March and Ian, I'll get your thoughts on this because I find it quite interesting that the SPFL decided to release a statement for this. It says an SPFL spokesperson said the postponement of any match is disappointing given the impact it has on supporters. This was particularly disappointing given the fact it was a live Sky Sports match and the proximity of the match to the split. The SPFL will be investigating the circumstances surrounding this postponement. First of all, what do you make of that statement and secondly do you think anything will be done and should it be done um it definitely should um i think that the key thing here is this was supposed to be like the big game of the weekend in scottish football from a sky perspective like they're going to look at it the same way like sort of clement was commenting after it got um called off but there was one game in the whole of like professional british football over the weekend that got called off just isn't good enough like it's flat out isn't good enough um the late call off, the the whole sort of circus around that as well. That's not going to make anyone look good from a Dundee perspective. Um, and it just sort of goes back to the whole like it's a bit of a tin pot situation. Really, this this wouldn't happen in the English Premiership. Obviously, it just wouldn't happen. Yet that's what the fourth time Dundee have had a game called off this season. Second at the last minute. I mean, I think Aberdeen journey. Aberdeen and the other fans had travelled down as well, which is kind of funny for them to be honest. But from a bigger perspective. That's it's not good enough. Again, um, 
I think the comms thing is quite a big part of this as well. The fact that Rangers had to find out through their own kit man when he arrived, that's again just, it's just unprofessional. For, for want of yeah. a better phrase, it's just not good enough. Um, and I can imagine someone in Sky has had a word with the SPFL to release this kind of statement and try and clamp down on it. I don't, I don't see why they would have released that statement otherwise. And it shows that they are actually doing something about it, hopefully. So, yeah, it's just it's such a stupid Scottish football thing, but we should be used to these by now. Yeah, uh, Sharpie Staunch, and I've been practising that name all day, by the way, so I get that right, um, says, apparently it's the fifth time this season it's happened at Dundee. You should be warned that anymore. They are forfeit in the match. I, I, it would be incredible from from a footballing point of view if that actually happened, but something needs to be done about it, clearly. Um, Kieran, I think this is the moment. I know you and I were messaging earlier on in the day, and you're wanting to talk about the, the the state of Scottish football as a whole, and and this was a, a a part of it in terms. I think Ian's used the correct word, the word we've seen a lot on on social media, and it's totally tin pot, isn't it? So, listen, if you want to take it away for the next 10, 20 minutes, you can get on your soapbox, and <laughs> we'll, we'll wind you up and let you go. All right. I'll accept five, but this is just a <laughs> tip of the iceberg for me for the past what few weeks that Scottish football just really needs a major, major shake-up in terms of you you look at what's happened in the past few weeks, the stuff with VAR and the referees and the referees being part-time and now the head of referee in Crawford Allen um, has left by mutual consent. That's got to be someone from the outside coming in and it's operated at a top level. Like It can't be somebody that's going to lead to conspiracies and all the rest of it and we need to move in the direction of getting full-time referees. Now, I've never known a product, especially one like Scottish football, that doesn't want to improve and doesn't want to get better. And by the governance above, it's just a kind of old man social club where they're all looking after each other and looking after their positions. There needs to be a major shake-up. We've got no sponsor for the league. The television deal is one of the worst I've ever seen, and we're so far behind we had an opportunity to scrap the 3 p.m. blackout and we didn't take it. Now, how, how are you going to improve a product if, one, you can't get it out there in front of people, in front of the viewers? And if I'm right in saying per capita in Scotland, our viewership, viewership and interest in football is one of the best in Europe. Yep. So, so you attract a bigger audience, you get bigger sponsors, you generate more money. Now, I look at teams across... Europe and say, take for example the Redivisie that seems so further forward than Scotland but we're almost at the same level in terms of how competitive it is in terms of the structure everything they seem so much further advanced in terms of scrapping plastic pitches contributing is it 3.75 percent of European money into the actual game there which covers things like VAR and their pitches like why are we not doing things like this I remember what the early 2000s when we had some of the best players around Europe playing for Rangers and Celtic, matching wages of the Premiership, and we kind of get near it now. I know that's sort of pie in the sky stuff and we're miles, but we're falling behind things as well, like reducing fan allocations. There's got to be a rule that it's like, I don't care if you're Rangers, you're Celtic, you're St. Johnson, you're Motherwell. Here's what you have to offer your away fans. If you don't sell this amount for your home fans, then there's a suggestion that you can sell even more or you shouldn't be cutting allocation. Like, Why should the fans miss out again? I get that fans misbehave and there is a behaviour in the culture of fans in Scotland, but do you know what that comes from? The governing body not hammering teams when their fans don't behave. Like, we've seen it in Europe, right? And admittedly so, I don't hear as much sectarian singing, if any, on European nights now because we get hammered for it and we were right to be hammered for it. Um, it's just the product itself, even like the via play, I don't know any set of fans that doesn't moan about guys like Michael Stewart and Stephen Cragen commentating on our games. You look at bigger sports around the world, their commentators and their broadcast journalists get paid a fortune because it adds to the product. You watch games with... I could watch any game of football, and Stephen McCoy, Tilsley, even Darren Fletcher are commentating. I enjoy it that wee bit more. 
and yeah. that's what makes the prod better. You even look at us during um during the COVID season, like we had like guys like Sunest, Hildesley, like Walter Smith even in the studio, and like it made the product so much better. We're eating ourselves alive in Scotland and it's only getting worse. And for me, this whole pitch debacle is just the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. I was involved in amateur football for years and I still keep an eye on it. And even at the weekend, I didn't see a single amateur football game on a council pitch. I can called off. And the only reason that the SFA have took action, right? And you guys can disagree with me if you want. Do you think we're reading that statement there if this game isn't live on Sky? I mean, hell, yeah, it's going to respond to whenever they want because they just bow down to some tin pot club like Dundee that have had four games called off, whose bus broke down at Parkhead and had to get a lift to the stadium, and they've been late for kickoffs this year. I mean, come on, are we going to start taking Scottish football serious and get it to the levels it should be? It's just, it's about time there was just massive change at the top, and ah, uh, I think I'm running out of breath now. I could be here all night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that's fine. I was I was just hoping you were going to keep going into the end of the show there to go on have you Kieran. But no, yeah, I totally agree with you. You do uh, raise some some really really good points in that. And before we before <laughs> before we move on, Ross, <laughs> Ross here, I said, tell us how you really feel, Kieran. But it's 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 totally fair because it, it is. It, it's just I mean, even people that I know, you know, pals that you know are abroad and and are you know down in England and all that stuff are just like. Man, rain must have been really bad up up there if, if your game's getting called off and you're just like no it's just because it's a joke it's, it's like yeah you can't even defend it that's the difficult um thing about it as well but see, honest, you know but like sorry to jump in really but see like obviously dundee's argument here is that they the, the pitch is beside a quarry um the quarry overfills and that then leads to the stadium and then it's waterlogged what can they do kind of thing i don't really see how this gets better to but i don't see the investment coming i i, I don't see a bring big new fancy sky deal coming in kind of thing they're just going to kind of cheap out as always on us like is there a market there for scottish football the way it currently stands and i, I don't think there is really I, I don't know if you guys think there is and there's some kind of other company that's going to come in and kind of save the day but mm -hmm. i worry how we get to that level like to, to get all these sort of these 10 other clubs basically how do you get them the money to make make them better make their facilities better make their players better make the league better where where's that going to come from is there an argument for that tv deal being that bad that would it be really sort of worth taking the chance that we're self-sufficient and we sell our own rights to the games and on a subscription basis where it's online i think we're at a day and age now where we could do that. I know that Roger Mitchell um, suggested this before he left the SPL setup years ago, but I don't think we were in a time and place then where streaming subscriptions and packages were that common or advanced that we could. But is it a time that sort of we, in essence, want a cliche lead the revolution in the way that we become the first league that do this and we come up with a structure where fans can buy. I know that the whole argument is uh, the 3 p.m. kickoff stuff and people selling their own rights is people have stopped going to games. That there's American sports where you buy, I don't know, is it 72 hours before kickoff? If you have not sell a certain percentage of your tickets, then you're not allowed to sell the rights to the game. So if you've sell, say, 75% oh, wow. of your tickets that are available, then you're well within your rights to sell the rights to your game because you know you've sold the tickets. Like, We've got to be forward thinking, and it's just a million miles per uh, mile. mile yeah. I'm getting tongue twisted. I'm just. <laughs> I don't know what you mean. You get what I mean. We need to be more forward thinking. We're stuck in the dark ages in Scotland. And uh, talk about TV deals. Why would you spend your money or a lot of money if you're a TV or a broadcaster in Scottish football when things like Dundee happen at the weekend? Why would you? Yep. Yeah, no, that, that that's that exactly. Uh, there's a couple of. Uh, comments coming in here. Paul McGarrigal here says uh, all our coefficient money for clubs should be deducted if a game is called off for a bad pitch. You know, that's a, it's a financial punishment. Uh, I'd never heard of that, what you just suggested there, Kieran, in terms of you, you know, a certain amount, a percentage of the tickets have to be sold 
uh, for you to actually be able to sell the right 72 hours. I, I think that's a fantastic idea. I really, really do. I never thought I'd be saying that. And this is Ibrox podcast, by the way. Um, mm. uh, then the other thing that, that I quite like, and it might cause a wee bit of controversy, is I know that the in the Eredivisie that got mentioned before that, you know, they have ring-fenced money from their Champions League or European qualifications and, and filter it down to the to the lower the clubs lower down the division so that they don't have artificial pitches so that they do have good pitches that might be an idea but is there enough money floating about in Scottish football where let's face it it's going to be the old firm are they going to agree to something like that I'm not sure and and maybe you know there's a lot of history going on between a lot of clubs and, and Rangers so would be, be would the fans be open to literally giving cash to like a, to a Dundee so that they have a half decent playing surface I don't know but listen we'll, we'll, we'll move on um, Ian <laughs> this did start by talking about the, the state of that Dundee pitch obviously Sky Sports uh, they had a wee tweet out earlier on today that I saw um, and it was that the Dundee v Rangers fixer has been rescheduled for the 10th of April live on Sky Sports. Interestingly enough, I think that's a Champions League night as well. I'm quite glad. I always used to, obviously you watch Champions League games, but it's always nice if Rangers are they participating in it. It's not a bad thing having having Rangers on a Wednesday night as well. But um, what do you make of this fixture being rescheduled for in particular after the old firm game on the 7th? Yeah, I, I couldn't have placed it better myself, to be honest. My big fear here was that it was going to be in between those games and then we've got a game, what, three, four days before the old firm. I think we all know we would see like a, a Cantwell leg break or something in that game if that was to happen. So <laughs> the fact it's pushed back, we've got then Ross County at the weekend, a few days after Dundee. On paper, a much nicer fixture if you can sort of rotate and swap a couple of players in, a couple of players out. It's ideal. So, um, yeah only positives to say about that for once and um delighted with it to be honest yeah and kieran your thoughts on it is it is it does it matter when this game was played are you like ian are you pretty delighted that it has been shifted to post old firm yeah ian's bang on the money there post old firm 100 percent. i did have a fear that it would be the wednesday before the old firm and given the state of our squad and the fact that we've needed this international break rest you then run the risk of um, suspensions, injuries, and we become at a slight disadvantage to Celtic there. This is arguably going to be our biggest game of the season. There's no doubt about it. And it could very well be a title decider, depending on how we got on against Hibs and they got on away to Livingston. So, yeah, delighted it's afterwards. Um, and hopefully we're, we're rolling into plenty of confidence off the back of a good one against Hibs. I remember... Years back, was it the game that Boyd scored five? There was the Bagheera World Day against Dundee United midweek, and then all of a sudden, Kenny Miller gets sent off for missing for him against the, our greatest rivals. And uh, I, I was having flashbacks to that, thinking that this game could be midweek against another team for Dundee. Yeah. That's it. It's, uh, it's all very interesting. But yeah, I'm in total agreement with the two of you. I'm thrilled that it's actually post old firm and, and we don't have to worry about players <laughs> getting leathered because you can just guarantee it is dodgy pitch dodgy inbox as well uh up in dundee and i and um yeah I'll, i won't say any more on that or we'll have to mention the tii lawyers again um but uh look the other interesting news that came out today and i'll stick with you here on this kieran was there was a pre-season friendly announced um through all official channels uh i think it's uh i say i think i know rangers are playing man united i can't remember the date exactly it's 20th of july sorry i've got it written down here at murrayfield interestingly enough i think that's largely due to the fact that you know rangers are renovating ibrooks there's going to be 600 extra seats i think put in and obviously they're looking to add more spaces in the wheelchair users area um the cheapest ticket that on the email that Everybody got a bar in <laughs> was yeah. uh, but I could see was it <laughs> but but was 37 quid. Having a look on the Ticketmaster website, I think the cheapest one I could see was 45, and that wasn't including all the you know the ticket booking fees, the fees that will go to you know Murrayfield as well. Um, 
But yeah, it's pretty steep for a for a friendly, and, you, and that's still getting to Edinburgh. What do you think about the uh, the game in particular, and and what do you think about the pricing of it? I'm gonna get an. I'm gonna get an up with me and say I will not be there. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like a hell of a lot of money, and considering um, from what I heard earlier, that Man United's first team are the ones that will be at the Euros, which I presume will be the vast majority of that squad are not due back in full training until the week after this friendly. So you're going to see a Rangers up against some sort of Man United reserves, and who knows the Rangers players that go at the Euros possibly might not be back for that game either. So. Right out the right out the gate, it sounds like a very drab friendly, and for that sort of price, been through Edinburgh and Murrayfield, I'm quite lucky. I've got a decent enough link here um, to is it Haymarket's the one next to Murrayfield, um, straight through to there. But now nah, I can't see me going to this one as much as I love going to watch Rangers everywhere. It is very very steep, and yeah, if Harry Maguire's not going to be playing, then I'm no interested. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's that. Uh, Ian, will you be travelling through to Edinburgh for the uh, Ahmad Diallo uh, derby? That's bizarre. I was just about to say I'm only going for Ahmad Diallo. That's an absolute fanboy, the guy. Um, I I don't know. When it, when it came out, I thought it was quite a nice to be away day. I'd take my boy through, might take the missus, but then I was torn up, and that's like £150 to watch Diallo. Um, not too sure. I think the important thing here is, is, as Paul in the comments touched on there, we're like the guests here. We're the away team in a way because, man, you've got some kind of agreement with Murrayfield or, or with something of that sort. And um, they play there once a year. It was Leon last year. They've invited us this year. So it's not like Rangers have dictated the prices here. I can. I, I don't think it's more of a Man U thing. Yeah. That we've just been invited to. So that's kind of. It's, I don't think it's a Rangers thing i think we have we have a big part of that Um what was interesting to me though is when you look at the the website that we put on like about the game it does say it may be the only scottish based friendly that rangers partake in that might just be to try and like drive up the sales a little bit who knows but it does give me a bit of hope there's maybe a an away uk game on, on the go i've not seen that for years i don't know why we stopped that we've obviously seen the, the sheffield wednesday game and i think people still watch the videos of the fans that day kind of thing so Hopefully we've got one of them lined up and be a bit more inclined to go to that. Um, but yeah, just a wee, a wee friendly game. I think it's still a bit of a, a bit of a riot over nothing kind of thing. It's, it's probably a good endorsement for us. I mean, people, man, you have got what a billion fans across the world. So if we can get a wee, wee slice of that market, why not? That's it's a good yeah. good wee day out for some if you get the money for it. A billion fans across the world, none of them in Manchester. That's the thing about <laughs> it, isn't it? Exactly the same joke. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. Um, yes, yeah, so there's a, f- a few comments coming in here. Uh, the catalyst says here couldn't care less about that Man United friendly. And and to your point, I think it's to do with the the renovations that are going on at the stadium. I can to- I, I don't think there'll be any preseason friendlies mm. played at Ibrox. Um, if 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 the work. Uh, they are to add the additional seating and the, the wheelchair user space uh, as well. Um, but look, we'll come on to the the crux of the pot. I didn't think it would take 40 minutes to get to that, man. We've done well. So um, the question is, is who will step up for Rangers in the title race? I've got five players written down here, um, but I'm dead interested to see what your guys' thoughts are on it. I think out of the five of it, Three are absolute bankers. Two might be a wee bit more controversial given um, recent comments on, you know, some people on this pod, but especially comments that, that I've been reading. Um, it's, yeah, this guy's been getting a bit of a tough time of it lately, but I'll start with you, Kieran. It's Connor Goldson. How important will Connor Goldson be until now and for the title running? Quite like the question, man. Um, he's going to have to turn a wee corner form-wise. He's dipped. Um, again, I think we're repeating ourselves here. He's probably going to benefit the most from this break. Um, I hope he's got about six spa days booked and he's got the feet up and the missus is looking after the kids and he's doing as little as possible. Um, he's a massive player for us and whether folk like it or not, and I think our, our fan base or a minority of them really enjoy having a whipping boy, regardless of who it is in our team. They always seem to have one, and Goldson's been the one that's copped it recently, but he's the leader at centre-back for us. When he's playing well, the team seem to play well, and 
the stats before he's sort of dipping form are very, very good in the league especially. So he can be very important for us, but he needs a wee turn in form. He needs he needs a big game to kick. Uh, so he's been so informed that, that, that he's f- frozen Kieran there, but uh, Aldo RFC here just says, "Ah, oh, there, oh, there we go." Well, <laughs> Goldson sucks, and 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 that's kind of a lot of the comments, especially I've been noticing. I, I guess I think he's been his his excellent self, like he has been in the previous seasons. Maybe not quite up to that standard, but he has been fairly solid. Remember, there's been a lot of injuries happening in front of him. Um, this year, I'm sure you know he's had his own injury problems, you know, going back last season as well that that affected them. So, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure, but it's, in, in terms of his, his leadership qualities, I think that's where it really, really stands out. Ian Connor Goldson for you. We've conceded 16 goals in the league this season. Goldson doesn't suck. That's not happening. Not having it. Um, he's maybe not in his best form his career. I'll get that. He's had a couple of mistakes and I can see the kind of narrative um, we need a weapon boy he's kind of one of the easiest ones to go for but he's still like the first name of the team sheet for me kind of thing he's he's vital um, if you look at who comes in if he does happen to step out I, I don't really trust Balogun to play like multiple games and then yeah, you're talking about guys like Ben Davies or something coming in it's just it's just not on so Goldson is vital for this team as Kieran says, if he's got a wee spa day or two lined up, it's only going to do him and us the world a good. Yeah, totally agree there. Um, Ibrox, oh, sorry, Joe Knight here says, Ibrox noise are blaming Lundstrom. He's no Ryan Jack for sure. Golton does suck though. <laughs> he's a pole watcher. Um, that brings me on to my next player nicely and I'll stick with you here, Ian. John Lundstrom, the man that's been like a butterfly he's totally transformed under and i bet you that's the first time he's ever been called a butterfly i wait for the comments coming in on that one um but he's been totally transformed under philippe clement a, a guy i thought was you know if you'd have told me you know that couple of months leading up to that january transfer window that he was off i'd have said bye bye to him but he's been oh, arguably for me the most important player in our squad um since clement's come on yeah, I don't even think he was that bad under Bill. to be honest. I don't, I don't think he was one of the ones that were as poor as the rest kind of thing. I thought he was okay. But as you say, since Clements came in, he's, he's became like Clements guy kind of thing. He's just centre of everything, dictating the play, a couple of assists here and there. He's He's been a major player. I think that the big problem, though, is that we have sort of ran him into the ground a little bit. And you saw away in Benfica and then the game just after, he just looks knackered kind of thing. He looks like he probably more than anyone needs a rest, needs a wee two-week break just to reset, recharge um, and go again. But John Lundstrom, playing for his future, playing for a contract, whether that's here or somewhere else, full of motivation. I think one thing that he, he did say in an interview a couple of months back now was that he, he's a bit regretful of how little he's actually won up here, considering he's played every week, he's played in a lot of big games at this point, he's played in finals. I think he's got what two winners medals, two or three winners medals kind of thing. He's going to want to end, if he is ending his career, which, I mean, I, I don't want him to be, but you never know if, if he's not getting the money in the year on his contract that he's going to want, he's not going to stick around. So he's going to want to end on a high. Um, I think he, like, just sort of repeat myself, but a couple of weeks rest here. I'm hoping he comes back flying and drives us on to a couple more trophies this year. Yeah, a couple of comments here. Uh, Sharpie Staunch says, before Clement came in, Lundstrom had a first touch, <laughs> like a snooker table cushion. And Nicola R. Stubbins says, Lundstrom is streets ahead of Raskin. Somebody who I definitely want to come on and talk about later. If we drop Lundstrom for Raskin, then we will win no more trophies. Um, you think John Lundstrom will be a key player for us in this title run in, Kieran? 110%. He's been phenomenal since Clement came in and Ian was right, it wasn't that bad under Bill. I just felt he was a wee bit passive, maybe. He was uh, in that Borna Barisic mode where he just loved to pass to the centre-backs or side to side. And Yeah, there was too much lateral. And I think when Clement came in, and I think in the pod we spoke about who would be the players that would benefit from, from that the most. And I remember hearing the quotes from Clement after that first game against Hibs or just before that in the presser, I think it was, where he spoke about he wants players to take risks and pass the ball forward. And when the pass is on to 
sort of break the fences down to take it. And Lundstrom's the one that's benefited from that the most. Um, I, I really, really hope he stays next year. In terms of that contract situation, I, I don't know where the club's at with it. If we're waiting to see if we qualify for the Champions League to see if there's funds available to give them the deal, which I, I thoroughly believe that he deserves. If Clement's going to be here, Lundstrom's going to be a key, key player for us. Now, you think to yourself, how much would it cost us to replace Lundstrom? I think at the moment it would cost a lot, a lot of money. Um, so I, yeah. I don't know how much he's on. I know for sure he's one of the highest earners at the club. That's for him and his agent and the club to sort it out. I know that it very much sounds like all parties want John Lundstrom to be here next season. It's whether or not they can come up with a deal. And sadly, that's football. But in terms of this season, and I, I like what Aldo RFC says there in the comments. We need him to turn up against Celtic. I think he's due a big performance against Celtic. And the other thing we've got to remember with Lundstrom as well is that apart from that small blip round about the uh, new year, I think that's the only injury he's really had since he came here. He's, he's always fit. He's ever present. Yeah, uh, Don Deliver Cars here says, I wouldn't give Lundstrom a new contract. Um, I think that's an opinion that goes against the, the grain. I'm, I'm surprised at that. His, his form, I would be throwing money at him if under this current form. But I suppose it, it, the other side of it, he's peaked in trough quite high and quite low um, during his Rangers career. And is that a guy we can afford to have? Maybe not, but under this form, absolutely. And RFC72 here says, Lunny was asked to do so much before Clement came in. Clement has just simplified his game and we're getting the benefits from it. And that, for me, is nail head hit it. Um, I said there was three players that were absolute bankers for this. The other two, and I'll go to you first here, Ian, uh, James Tavernier. How important is he going to be? He's the key. He's, he's <laughs> the man. He's he's everything to me, and he's everything to this club. He's an absolute legend already. Um, I, I I want Rangers to win trophies for myself, but for Tav just as much. I, I, I hate the kind of negativity around him, the the loser thing that he gets branded with, the, the bloody disappointment video you see every fucking six months. But he's he's so key not only like in terms of like the goals he scores the assists they get but i think his defending has come on so much just in the last like sort of six months or so when you saw against benfica um the amount of sort of good positions he got into it like stop attacks or to to be that last ditch defender kind of thing i don't remember to have ever getting those sort of comments for his defending so that's massive and then i think this new sort of thing we've seen a little bit is this like inverted way that he's trying to play where he's suddenly popping up in like the center of the park or sort of mm -hmm. closer to Dessers than anyone else. It's just a little new dimension that we've picked up, but it's just it's just a little sort of sort of tactical tweak that you've saw from Clement. And I don't think he's had a lot of time at this point on the training pitch to do that sort of thing. So it just sort of goes back to what the earlier point was, this two week break can hopefully be a chance mm -hmm. to drum that into some of the players who are staying back a little bit more and just give us a bit of a different dimension. Um but yeah to have Tav speaks himself. Uh, Tav does what Tav does, kind of thing. But he's he's massive for this club um, still. So he's he's one of the main men for sure. Yeah, and I think I'll add to that, and and I'll, I'm gonna put my neck out here and say that I'm since Comont has come in, I would say this is the best I've ever seen Tav from a defensive point of view. Yes. I know we didn't win that game against Benfica, but I thought defensively he was superb. I thought I thought he was one of the few players for Rangers that could actually handle Rafa Silva that night. Um but Kieran the next player I'll come on to for you and and I love talking about this guy. Um maybe maybe unfortunate he didn't get an England call up but I'm I'm glad he's he's not there because that would be the most Rangers thing ever is for Jack Button <laughs> to go get an England <laughs> call up and get injured while he was on international duty. But yeah, how how important is the big man going to be uh, between the sticks for us until the end of the season? Oh, absolutely. He is the front runner for Player of the Year for Rangers this year, possibly the league as well. Um, he's been phenomenal for us. He's been a great signing. I think it's one we could maybe thank Bill for and probably one of the only things we could thank him for <laughs> in his return. <laughs> um, and he, he certainly looks like a Rangers player, doesn't he? He's a big handsome lad. I got to do his unveiling when I was uh, lucky enough to go along for this, his eyebrows, and he was just... Uh, 
the key, the, just the pure professional. He was so nice to everybody as well and so down to earth and just so happy to be here. And I think his love affair with the club has just grown and grown. And again, I spoke about Fabio Silva, Wills and, and being down there. I think Butland sort of was in the same situation a lot of the time mid-table mediocrity and just stay in the league and don't get relegated. It was around clubs like that and no disrespect to who he's been with. Um, but in terms of um, Butland at Rangers, he has been phenomenal. He's been brilliant and he's just the picture of calmness in that back line, considering how long we've been used to Alan McGregor running around like, uh, a, <laughs> I don't know the best way to put this, like he's got Tourette's. Just screaming at defenders and screaming at refs and screaming at linesmen and volleying opposition strikers. <laughs> We've now got Jack Butland. Um, and I know a lot of people say, I hope we make a lot of money off him, but I hope he sticks around at Rangers for a long time because as long as we've got Jack Butland and goals, I'm very confident we can win things. Yeah, I think I think that's a, a fair comment and I totally agree with you in terms of the player of the year, player of the season shout, I th it would be incredible for, for Rangers to have two goalkeepers being awarded player of the season given that Alan McGregor was awarded that a couple of years ago and and I, and I find I would find it really hard to, to disagree with Butland given some of the, because his highlight reel will be spectacular at the end of the, the season um, right, this is where it gets a bit more controversial, uh, Ian you've got the next one, Cyril Dessers and I've seen a few comments there saying our strikers need to start scoring goals but listen he is for me our only oh, I, was, I forgot about Kamar Roof but oh, I was going to hit back with Roof on you mate but, <laughs> I'll let you go but listen is he's going to be important because he's he's a I'll I'll change that slightly by saying he's our only fully fat central striker yeah that's a, <laughs> a really positive <laughs> positive thing to say isn't it um, I, I don't know. I, see, the thing with Dessler's is, right, his best form for us came when he wasn't relied on. So see when we could take him out for a game and throw on for 20 minutes or vice versa. He was getting goals from the start. He was getting goals when he came on. I don't know if it's like a pressure thing, a mentality thing, but he... I've never seen a player be so good at times and so like crafty and, and good finisher and, and yet also be horrific to watch. And just frustrate the life out of you. He's he's such a strange, strange guy. Um, I, I don't know. I, I'm really my worry with this, like the way the games are going. There is I don't see goals in the front line without Seema, without Cantwell, and I think a lot of the season comes down to like Seema getting fit and then having that chance to sort of drop Dessers and bring him back in here and play him there and give him a rest. I don't know if it's a rest thing, maybe he just runs himself on the ground too much, but I still I still don't like watching him. I still don't like when he's on the pitch, even though he had a little purple patch. I just don't see it coming back, which sounds incredibly negative after the conversation we've had in the last 10 minutes. But if we are starting him in big games still, I'm not confident we're getting the goals in the big games in it's going to take a lot for Cyril to bring me back on side at this point. No, I, I, I think that's fair enough. I, you know, I, I agree with that in terms of I don't think I'll be disappointed if he if he goes at the end of the season. But I, I, he's got a big part to play. He's he, he's going to be the striker that whether we like it or not that we are going to be relying on uh, the most uh, from now until the end of the season. So uh, everybody, put your seatbelts on and, and strap in for the ride for that one. Um, going to stick with the forward areas. A player that's not actually played for us in a few months. I think he's due back either the end of this month, early April. And that is Abdullah Sima, Kieran. How important is a guy like Abdullah Sima going to be for the for the title running? Hundred percent. I think it would give the fans a lift. I think it would give the team a lift. Considering how many important goals he scored, do you think uh, Hearts away at Tynecastle, the game we won one now, um, the subliminal assist from Tavernier um, for Sima to slot it away, and just he's powerful. He's probably one of the quickest players I've ever seen. He's He's, a, he's great in the air, he's a good finisher, he's everything that we want in our number nine area. And if that's the striker that we sign at the end of the season, I will be delighted. The quicker we can get him back, the better. And I think the if I'm right in saying we were quoted, what was it, 10 to 12 weeks, it would be back. And I think we're coming into the 12th week. So 
I think we should expect news on that um, when we come back after the international break. I really hope we get the news, but I, I, I did time, but in a wee bit and saying, I think Kamar Roof will be more important than any striker for us. And I think come the old firm game, and if, if people want to agree with me or disagree with me in the comments, I think we slide all our chips into the middle of the table and say Kemar Roof starts and if he gets injured, so be it. But I think he's our best chance of goals in our team. And that's, for me, the old firm game at Ibrooks is make or break. Roof's got to start 100%. Fit Seymour, no fit Seymour. Dessers banging five in against Hibs. I don't care. Kemar Roof has got to start that old firm game. I know it's it's the year twenty thirty one and Rangers fans are still calling for a for a for a partially fat roof to be to be starting. Yeah, he's, he's an interesting character. I, I agree with you there in terms of um, you know he, he scores goals, but he's just his legs are glass. Let, let's face it, he's got good mentality. Really like the guy as a as a person and stuff like that. But it's just his his body just can't handle it and. Yes, it's an interesting one. Do you go and get the goals early or do you wait to the end? Look, and listen, I think the the, the last play, because I, I cannot believe <laughs> how quietly the time has crept up on us on this podcast, but there's numerous players we could mention here. Todd Cantwell, I think, will play a huge part. Nico Raskin, I know we've already talked about him, but in terms of coming in and, and, and you know, because we've had a lot of injuries in that central midfield, if we can get him on a game in that first six months that he had at Rangers, you know, I think he could be really key. Tom Lawrence, Rabbi Matondo, just in terms of helping out and rotation and on the wide, um, uh, the flanks, I should say. But this guy, um, I'm going to mention him here. Uh, it is, and Sid said it, he said, big Dujon will be vital. Look what happened when he didn't play Ibrox v Benfica. Come to you first, Ian, on this before before we go. How important will Dujon Sterling be? Because for me, he he could be one of the most important players. Yeah, I, th I think there's two kind of main reasons for me why he is so vital. Um, in terms of him himself, like the the ability he's got, the power he's got, the pace, he's got everything you want in like an athlete of a footballer, which our squad doesn't really have through it. I mean, Tav, I think, was that, but he's got 32 now. He's not quite got the, the legs and the lungs on him that he did, whereas Sterling's power just sheer power but the probably more important factor in this is how he can play anywhere which then ties into what i think is our weakest area of the team which is probably the right wing there's no one else that i can see playing right wing that i'm going to enjoy seeing there is the most basic way i can put that like i don't really trust mccausley to get the goals and assists matondo is hot and cold at best scott wright and then Beyond that, there's just I, I don't see who else can serve the right. I don't know if there's a way Diomande can play in the right kind of thing, but if you're building your like perfect range of living at this point, Sterling is probably in everybody's, and it's it's a case of he's so good at anything <laughs> that he could just slot in anywhere. But I think right midfield, we saw it against Hibs, he won the penalty, had another chance he could have scored. He's so so key to what we're trying to do, um, and yes, yeah, it's, it's it's mass. I think when him. Um, when Clement came out and said his injury wasn't a bad one, I was so buzzing for that at, at that point. Like the fact he could have maybe played at Dundee, he could have been in the squad kind of thing, should mean that he's fine given the uh, the break we're having here. And for Hibs, I'm hoping he's he's back in that starting lineup. Yeah, totally, totally agree there. Um, with you, a couple of comments here, Kieran, before I get your thoughts. Uh, KW here says Sterling could be a bulldozer against Celtic, and I love that word right. because I, I think that's that's the what he is. He's an absolute unit uh, and Chris BC says no matter the position Sterling must play if we could just clone him 11 times and yes I'm including him in the in the goalkeeping position there that would be ideal but yeah do John Sterling or, or maybe you want to talk about another player before before we go Kieran no I'll stick with Sterling I think yeah. I don't want to be controversial here right I don't think he's as good as what people make out now hear me out here I've never seen a player so raw with so much potential as in, like, his flow's it's quite hard. high. No, I'm not meaning he's a bad player, <laughs> by all means. I think a lot of the... I, I think there's a huge hype train, right? He's, yes, he's a starter at right mid just now, but I don't think that means that we don't go and look for a right winger in the summer, yep. right? But the here and now, 
Sterling starts for me, right? Sterling starts every single week, but his skill set is very <laughs> different, as in he's a ball winner high up the park at, at right wing. Um, he's fast, he's lightning quick. I remember when the, the players done the sort of YouTube video for the EAFC coming out and they were talking about the, the player cards, the ultimate team ones. They were saying what stats are wrong and all the players were like, oh my God, Sterling is so much quicker than they've got him down here. He is lightning. And we've seen it yeah. on the pitch, especially that instant against Hibs where he won the penalty and get in behind yeah. just after it. So for me, when I say the hype's all the way up here, the ceiling is so much higher than that. He could go on and really do big things, but it's about honing everything he's got, his pace, his power. Maybe could be a wee bit technically better with the ball at his feet. He can be a wee bit looser sometimes, but he's got all the credentials to go really, really high. And I think that's why guys are getting overexcited about him. Um, and I'm really looking forward to see what we can produce. And I think that's where the the likeness comes to, to Calvin Bassey. He was so raw when he arrived and, the upward trajectory of that six months post Christmas under Geo were like nothing I've ever seen a player reach in, in my life. And Sterling's got the potential to do that too. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm going to disagree with you slightly on the height. I can see where you're coming from, but but I can't remember ever a player that who is a natural right back who has just fitted in central midfield so seamlessly like that and okay is there room for improvement yeah but just I've never seen a transition like that and you could see him getting better and better each game he played in centre midfield it was the same with being out uh, wide right okay the first time when we saw him on the left against St Johnston I was a bit I didn't think it was the right yep. I, I thought that was maybe one of the positions you shouldn't play but you know we saw him the next game saw him the next game and he, I think was it the um, I'm sure he had a great cross in against Hearts it might have been even the one neither Des or scored or the one we got the penalty for the for the hand the ball is it, was that I'm I sure maybe Des or scored from I think you're correct it was a bit of yeah. a cross and then a smash yeah, so that that's what it is. He's just adapted to, to to every position so well. But listen, I think that's been a really good pod, given it's been an international break. I just want to thank both my guests. So thank you for joining us tonight, Kieran. Always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. And thank you very much, Ian. Thanks, mate. No, I enjoyed that as always. Brilliant. So uh, just to let everybody out there know, we'll be back this Sunday at half eight. I'm not sure who's doing that pod, but I'm sure there'll be lots to talk about as always as there's always something to talk about with rangers but thank you all to everybody watching and listening out there uh, and just a wee side note if you don't know we're also available on apple podcast and spotify all these shows got up there um the next morning after we do them once they've been uh, tidied up and all that stuff but listen take care everybody and we'll see you all soon <laughs>